Level 9, 8, 9. Welcome to 989 on Health, where you don't need years of university to understand the latest news about health and related subjects. As always, we've created a list of helpful links for you to explore more info on today's topic at our website, level989.com, and those same links should also be visible in your podcast playing app of choice. This is an informal discussion sharing our personal viewpoints on health and wellness. Don't rely on the information in this podcast as an alternative to medical advice from a professional healthcare provider. For the full disclaimer, please see our website. I'm Mike Davalos, just a guy, your average Joe, and I'm joined by the opposite of average, Brandon Weintraub, a primary care physician. Good morning, Brandon. Good morning, Mike. Our topic for today is sugar. From mother's milk to honey to granulated sugar and everything in between, sugar is omnipresent in our lives. In ancient Greece, sugar was a rare imported substance that was used as a medicine. Even hundreds of years after sugarcane was being grown and processed, it remained a luxury right up until the 18th century when it finally became more widely available. It's crazy to think how ubiquitous sugar is now compared to just a few hundred years ago. It would be like, well, say, the finest, most exclusive caviar going from an imported rare treat that only the king and his cronies could afford to enjoy to an ingredient in everything. And I mean everything. Today's sugar is used in products from bread to spaghetti sauce, from salad dressing to yogurt. If a time traveler showed up today and told you that this tiny tin of beluga caviar at $3,000 for 250 grams. Sure, it was an elite delicacy in 2017, but in the distant year 2217, not only would that same caviar sell for 50 cents per pound, but it would be an ingredient in darn near every single food product available on the market. You'd have trouble believing that. In this scenario, an ingredient that should be sampled in small amounts becomes a staple, going from a tiny little nibble on a cracker at a fancy party to 150 pounds a year. That's how much sugar the average American eats, and that's approaching half a pound per day. I'm, I'm not sure why you chose to go with caviar, but I, I feel I ought to warn against eating half a pound a day of fish eggs. They're pretty high in cholesterol and sodium. I know the caviar example is a bit odd, but it's an exaggerated example to make a point. Sugar is rare in the natural environment, and it should be rare in our diet. Back in the day, if you're a hunter-gatherer, finding anything sweet would have been a treat. And this is the an event or item that is out of the ordinary and gives great pleasure definition of treat, not the I bought another five pound bag of definition. And you might have to fight off a bear and a swarm of bees to earn your sweet reward. Sugar tastes good to us because it's a high energy food source, and being so rare, our taste buds are calibrated to scream, yes, yes, more of this, when it hits the tongue. When food is scarce, a little bit of something sweet could help give you the energy you need to hunt down that gazelle or fight off that predator. Brandon, can you break it down for us? What is sugar? As we've seen before with other terms, the word sugar as it is generally used today describes a set of organic compounds that occur naturally in most plants. It's not just a single substance. Sugar is the generalized name for sweet-tasting, soluble carbohydrates, which are composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. When it comes to nutrition, it's important to understand that sugars are simple carbohydrates, which don't contain the nutrients present in more complex carbohydrates, which are found in whole grains, fruits, and vegetables. We briefly touched on this back in the episode about diabetes, but we could use a refresher in some more detail now. How is sugar processed by the body? Let's start out with the organs involved. All right, the organs primarily involved in processing sugar. Well, it starts with the mouth. There's a digestive enzyme secreted by your salivary glands. The next major organ involved is probably the small intestine. There are a number of processes that occur in there, and the end result is that simple sugar ends up entering your bloodstream. From there, it heads to your liver and out to the other cells. While not directly involved in digestion and absorption of sugar, the pancreas also plays a significant role, especially in blood glucose regulation. All right, now I know this next bit could get really technical unless you're really careful, but can you explain the chemical process that takes the packet of sugar I poured into my coffee into something my body can actually use. I'm going to try to keep this super, super, super simple. Uh, consider this the Cliff Notes version. Your cells can utilize glucose, a very basic molecule of sugar, to create adenosine triphosphate, usually referred to as ATP, which is the most abundant energy carrier molecule and is used to drive various biological functions. Proteins and fats can provide energy as well, but sugars are the predominant energy source which your cells use as fuel. 
I mentioned in the beginning of this episode some of the random things you'll find sugar in that you might not have been expecting. It's not just the obvious things like ice cream or cake. There's a few more. Alcohol, energy drinks, fancy deluxe coffees, soda, whole milk, other dairy products, pasta, barbecue sauce, granola, vitamin water, soup. Soup? Yes, soup. Baked beans, smoothies, breakfast cereal. I'm sure I'm leaving out a few things. What did I miss? You've actually done a fine job listing a wide variety of foods that have added sugars, but you're right in assuming there are even more. Uh, Practically everything has added sugar to it these days. Uh, Rather than list all the food items with added sugars, I think it might be a good idea to give a list of the names sugar is listed as on food labels. I know we're going to get to that in a bit, though, so I'll wait. Now, I realize this episode isn't titled Diabetes 2 Electric Boogaloo, But in a way, it kind of is, since it's about sugar. While I was researching high sugar foods to avoid, I came across a few references to eating low-fat foods and recommendations to avoid fried foods. Uh, Now, are these actually somehow relevant to sugar or just general health? There are a few possible explanations why there's a connection between eating low-fat, non-fried foods and why these may have come up in your search for avoiding high sugar content foods. The first possible reason is that fried foods are often coated in breading and batter, which contains a fair amount of sugar. The second, and far more conspiracy-laden explanation, is that there seems to be some data that suggests excess sugar may be worse for your health than eating foods that have been demonized over the last 15 years or so, like saturated fats. So it may be that the tendency for articles and doctors to continue to push the avoidance of other foods besides sugar may have a monetary component as well. When it comes to ingredients that are well known to cause allergic reactions, food producers are legally required to clearly call out when an allergen is an ingredient in their product. The label might say, contains casein, a milk protein. And those people with milk allergies can read the label and know not to eat that product. Sugar's not considered an allergen, so this kind of clarity is lacking on food labels where sugar is concerned. So first, do you think food product labelers should be required to clearly announce sugar next to the sneaky chemical names they're using? Second, what are some of those sneaky chemical names so I can watch out for them? I'm not promising to change my behavior overnight, but some increased awareness would probably be a good thing. I actually don't mind that there isn't a big red sticker reading sugar in big letters. What I would like to see is a little bit more honesty in labeling techniques. I'll explain more in just a moment, but let me answer the second part of your question first. You'll understand why once we get to the end, I promise. Okay, cowboy, it's your rodeo. So, sugar gets called a whole lot of things these days. Some are just names of specific types of sugar molecules, like glucose, fructose, galactose, sucrose, lactose, and maltose. For the rest of the list, I hope you're settled in and comfy. You can also see sugars listed as anhydrous dextrose, agave nectar, syrup, malt syrup, brown sugar, fruit juice concentrates, nectars like peach nectar or pear nectar, cane crystals, cane sugar, molasses, cane juice, evaporated cane juice, raw sugar, corn sweetener, high fructose corn syrup, HFCS, corn syrup, maple syrup, honey, and invert sugar. If you see any of that list, on an ingredient label, you can feel confident sugar has been added to your meal. Okay, so you said you'd explain once you finished that long, long, incredibly long list. How do all these names lead to dishonesty of ingredient lists? Couldn't a company just label all of those sugar and save themselves a ton of money on printing ink? Well, yeah, they probably could. But here's where things get a little, hmm, sketchy. On food labels, the ingredients at the start of the list are the ones that are found in the highest amounts. In other words, if you look at the food label for a box of cereal, and the first word in the list is corn, you know that the main ingredient in the cereal is corn. That's well and good. It lets the consumer know what they're getting in an efficient and useful way. Imagine now, though, that one of the primary ingredients that a company has used has been deemed undesirable by the popular opinion, or by a recent research study. It isn't immediately poisonous, or carcinogenic or anything, but now foods containing a high content of that product are required not only to list the ingredient, but list it right at the top of their ingredients, and that's going to hurt their sales. I'm just as interested in economic theory as the next guy, but... He just replaced the word product in my little story with the word sugar. 
So here's what the company does. Instead of using the full portion of, say, brown sugar, as they would have in their original recipe, the company replaces half the amount of brown sugar with a different type, like maple syrup. With the amounts cut in half, brown sugar falls down the list of ingredients, and since they only used half the amount of maple syrup, that stays nice and low on the list as well. If they need to play with the label even more, the company could just add a third type of sugar, and a fourth, and so on and so forth, until lo and behold, they have a foodstuff that looks like it has almost no added sugar. Companies are also able to claim no sugar added so long as the sources of sugars come from a naturally occurring place. Uh, for example, if they coat a cereal with a fruit nectar to add sweetness. So I don't really need to see the big sticker warning that says sugar. I wouldn't mind, however, if the loopholes that allow companies to be less than honest with their consumers were closed up a bit. In my research for today's episode, I kept coming across references to added sugar. I suppose that's to contrast the amount of sugar naturally in a product. Now, is added sugar better, worse, just as bad? Does it matter? Or is it just the total amount that we should be focused on? Well, you've got it exactly right. Added sugar refers to sugars that are put into foods, above and beyond the naturally occurring sugars in the ingredients themselves. The rest of your question is a, a bit more complex. Added sugar isn't necessarily worse, but your body doesn't really need added sugars. Now, the fact is, your body doesn't distinguish between added sugars and natural sugars in your foods. So all you end up doing is adding sugar on top of sugar. The fiber and protein present in, in foods, alongside natural sugars, does moderate and help control the rate at which natural sugars are absorbed. So there is at least some argument that natural sugars are to be preferred. But at the end of the day, uh, keeping an eye on total sugar content is definitely your best bet. I want to try something. Uh, I'm going to take you through a list of items I really might eat in a normal mic day, and you'll tell me how much sugar that adds up to. Uh, are you sure you want to do this? There's no going back. Some things you can't unsee, Mike. It'll change you. I'm sure. How bad could it be? All right. You've been warned. Go ahead. I use an app called MyFitnessPal to enter and calculate my foods and get all the numbers. It's a pretty good app. You guys should definitely check it out. Now, for average breakfast, I'm going to have a bowl of cereal. It's frosted mini wheats, and I cut up a banana and put in it. I've got my, uh, some delicious whole milk on top of that. For lunch, I might have a sandwich with some ham, some salami. I might have some uh, pineapple on the side with some uh, chips. And then for dinner, I'm going to have some lasagna, a couple slices of bread, some butter on that, obviously. And then for my snacks, I had a couple of chocolate chip granola bars. I had a black cherry chobani yogurt, and I had a lot of coffee. It adds up to about 48 ounces in a given day. Brandon, I've presented my results for you as a chart, and our listeners will find a link to a screenshot of this chart if they want to take a look at it. Uh, now, one thing I think is odd is that carbs and sugar are listed as two different separate categories, and that seems misleading. So tell me, how bad is it? Don't be gentle. I have to admit, I often snack more than this on a real day. Carbohydrates are generally listed separately, even on food labels, because there is an official RDA value, or recommended daily allowance, for total carbohydrate intake. And it includes a few different items, uh, namely includes dietary fiber, sugars, and complex carbohydrates. The total carbohydrate value is the one used to estimate a food's impact on blood glucose levels, so it's important enough to get its own column. Well, uh, for the listeners who aren't looking at the chart right now, let me delay my response. I mean, let me give the important numbers. Uh, according to the chart here, uh, you took in about 201 grams of sugar over the course of a single day. What I find interesting is that the suggested goal for you is 63 grams. That means, uh, according to MyFitnessPal, you were over your suggested sugar intake by 138 grams. Well, that's not too bad, right? Right? Um, well, uh, the, the Institute of Medicine sets the recommended dietary allowance, or the RDA, for nutrients. Sugar isn't a required nutrient in your diet, so there isn't an official RDA for it. The general suggestion is that no more than 25% of calories a day come from added sugars, and no more than 38 to 55% of all of your calories come from carbohydrates. So who's ready for some math? It looks like you may have set your application to give you a reduced calorie intake, maybe trying to lose a little weight? So your suggested daily caloric intake is listed as 1,680 calories. 
A single gram of sugar has about 3.87 calories. Let's round up to four. So take the 201 grams of sugar you ate, multiply by four, and uh, so... How about that sports team event, am I right? Come on, I said not to be gentle. I can take it. <sighs> well, sugars alone, you're looking at a calorie content of a little over 800. That means that you took in 800 calories of sugar in a single day. If we use the 25% value that is generally suggested, you ought to have eaten no more than 420 calories from sugar. But wait, maybe you're okay. Let's go ahead and do the same calculation, but for the carbohydrates. That might balance things out. Let's use the 55% value, just to be generous. Following general suggestions, you would want to make sure you had no more than 924 calories from carbohydrates. Your chart says you ate 442 grams of carbohydrates. Still working with a four calorie estimate per gram, you're looking at a total of 1,768 calories from carbohydrates. Uh, I hate to say it, but either way, it looks like you managed to go over your suggested intake by almost double. Okay, uh, that isn't great news, but wait, hold on. The total carbohydrate column includes added sugars, right? I mean, what if we assume that Every single gram of sugar listed in its own column is added sugar. I know it isn't possible, but maybe it'll give me an idea of how much of a concern I need to have about sugars added to my foods. By my math, I would end up with a carbohydrate intake of only 964 calories. That's what I should be eating. I suppose it would be, yes. I've still got some bad news, though. For men, the American Heart Association suggests eating no more than 38 grams a day of added sugars which would mean, in our hypothetical situation, you managed to eat almost 165 grams more than you probably should have. Um, the American Heart Association suggests no more than 24 grams of added sugar for women, in case you were wondering. If it's any consolation, you aren't doing too much worse than the average American, who eat about 88 grams of sugar a day, already well over double the suggested values for men, and over triple the suggested value for women. Fine, so I definitely need to start watching my added sugar intake every day. Uh, where can I find that information? I'm ready to start buying products that have fewer added sugars. That's not actually going to be easy. I already mentioned earlier that products can state that they have no added sugar if they use ingredients that contain natural sugars only, even if that sugar content is very high. What's worse is that there is no legal requirement for companies to list natural sugars separately from added sugars. So there's no easy way to determine how much sugar content is added and how much is natural. As a consumer, the best you can do is try to learn as many of the terms for sugar as you can and read through the ingredient list in its entirety. The more you find, the higher you can expect the sugar content to be from added sugars. That is very upsetting. but. All right. Uh, I think we've made it clear what sugar is, uh, where you might find it, and how much you're probably taking in every day, either intentionally or incidentally. Now it's time for the scary part. Uh, what is all this sugar doing to our bodies? What are the health effects? I mean, diabetes we all know, but what else? Diabetes is certainly an important one. Eating more sugar increases the likelihood of obesity and brings along all the associated risks and concerns of being overweight. More recently, but in studies dating all the way back to the 1950s, there are indications that there is a strong link between excess sugar intake and an increased risk of heart conditions. In our high-tech world, we have a lot of high-tech artificial sweeteners, everything from NutraSweet to Stevia to Sweet and Low to Splenda. Why don't we just switch from cane and beet sugar to these substitutes? Bam! Problem solved! Well, uh, to a certain degree, I suppose you could give it a try. Artificial sweeteners on the market today have been through the FDA approval process, which means they've been deemed safe for consumption by the general populace. In the past, there were concerns about possible carcinogenic effects, which have since been dismissed for the most part. And almost every beverage company has the zero-calorie, zero-sugar version of their popular drinks. Unfortunately, there is some concern that the use of sugar substitutes might actually lead to increased risks of obesity, weight gain, metabolic syndrome, and cardiovascular disease, all on their own. And that's a list of concerns which looks an awful lot like the one you would see if you were eating excess regular sugar. So, while you could try using nothing but artificial replacements to reduce your sugar intake, 
Natural sugar at least has the benefit of being easily converted to usable energy by the body, as well as being found alongside vitamins and minerals, while artificial sweeteners have absolutely no nutritional value whatsoever. I think you mentioned that you had a few interesting sugar-related articles to direct our listeners to. I did indeed, and the links could be found for our listeners in today's episode notes. They all relate to an article in the Journal of American Medical Association uh, in November of 2016. Information is coming to light that, since 1965, the Sugar Research Foundation has been guiding and influencing the course of research and results regarding the dangers and effects of eating sugar. A study in 1965, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, singled out fat and cholesterol as the primary dietary causes of coronary heart disease, and downplayed evidence that sucrose consumption was also a risk factor, even though a statistical link had been discovered as early as 1950. Medical advice for years to come have been influenced by this very first study, and research continued to be controlled by corporate interests even to today. It sounds like a conspiracy theory, but this time there's a fair amount of evidence that medical knowledge has been influenced not by the tenets of science or the needs of the populace, but solely by economic forces. The articles are definitely worth a look, although the implications are extremely worrisome. All right, so as we've made very clear, too much sugar is bad, and most of us are almost certainly taking in too much on a daily basis. So what is the recommended intake? I seem to recall during our diabetes episode that we should all pretend that we have pre-diabetes and use that as our guide. Uh, now, is that still what you recommend? Well, we've gone over most of the guidelines already, but it can't hurt to hit the highlights. First and foremost, there are currently no official recommended values for added sugars. The American Heart Association has suggested trying to keep your daily caloric intake of added sugars to below 38 grams for men and below 24 grams for women. The USDA recommends that between 45 and 65 percent of your total caloric intake should come from carbohydrates. It can be a very tricky thing to get these values figured out, so it's always the wisest idea to make sure you keep a close eye on your blood sugar. Don't necessarily assume you're pre-diabetic, but using the same care and attention to sorting your diet and watching your natural and added sugar intake is a great way to start improving your health. Is there anything else you want to mention before we wrap it up? Oh, sugar. The love-hate relationship is almost as ingrained in American culture as baseball and <laughs> apple pie. As of 2016, more than one-third of adults in the United States are obese, and the number is only growing. As health continues to decline, many people are looking for any scapegoat, whether that scapegoat is gluten, fried foods, lack of time to exercise. Oftentimes, it's easier to blame something than to find a legitimate causal factor. Today's episode covers what I believe may be one of the most legitimate concerns plaguing American health. Sugar has managed to avoid being labeled as a potential detriment until fairly recently, and although medical science has accepted for some time that excess sugar intake can lead to weight gain, it is only recently that a more widespread understanding of the potential cardiac risks have begun to reach the general public. Sugar is a very tricky substance to track at the moment. The laws regarding listing of sugars on food labels allows for some very unfortunate ways for companies to, in the worst cases, intentionally obfuscate the amounts and details of natural and added sugars present in their products. This can make it incredibly difficult for even a dedicated consumer to figure out how much sugar they're actually eating. A certain amount of sugar, when found naturally occurring in things like fruits and vegetables, is a necessary part of keeping your body functional and healthy. But it's all too easy to end up eating far more sugar than you ought to simply by using a few prepackaged foods. Gaining control over your sugar intake isn't going to be an easy task, but based on the recent studies being published, the extra work is going to be worthwhile. The best thing you can do for yourself is to pay close attention to your food labels. Know what goes into your food, and when possible, make your meals yourself so you can be sure any added sugars are under your control. If you take the time, I'm willing to bet that you'll end up being glad you did. That's all the time we have for today. These short episodes are a brief overview of very complex topics. Everything we say is for entertainment and educational purposes only. Licensed healthcare professionals should advise you and be aware of changes you're planning to make to any aspect of your healthcare. Every person's needs are different. 
The links to references we've made about news articles, medical studies, or other materials can be found at level989.com, along with our contact information and the complete Don't Take Medical Advice from Podcasts disclaimer. Thanks for listening, and now go health yourself. Yeah.